What is going on, Gum Fighters? This is a extra episode, a recast of an older episode on up close gunfighting, close quarters battle. Hopefully you enjoy it. This is not to replace a new episode, but on Sunday where there's not normally an episode scheduled, I think this is a good episode that is often overlooked as a topic in the gunfighting community. So hopefully not among this community. With that, hopefully you enjoy. Hello gunfighters and aspiring gunfighters. Welcome back to Gunfighter Life. As always, I am your host, Michael Melito. First and foremost, I'm a Christian. I don't apologize for that. You don't have to like it, but you have to deal with it or go somewhere else. This is the podcast where we get together and talk about gunfighting from a Judeo-Christian worldview and a real-world first-hand perspective. Today we're going to be talking about CQB, CQC, whatever you want to call it, extreme, close, in, and personal gunfighting. We're talking about very close arm's length, or double arm's length, or even closer. We're talking about close, in, down, and dirty gunfighting today. Techniques, tips, philosophies. Before we get into the bio in today's topic, if you don't mind reaching down and hitting that like subscribe, and please leave a review of the podcast. Your support is appreciated. With that, we'll roll into the bio. If you want to skip the bio, you can generally skip to around three and a half, four and a half minutes in. Somewhere in there will get you, if not into, then pretty close to into the body of the subject. With that, first and foremost, I am a Christian. I make no apologies for that. It is first and foremost in my life, the greatest of all the commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I don't apologize for that. I am an alpha male, and as such, I follow the ultimate male, the ultimate alpha male, the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus Christ. A little bit about my background. In addition to that, I am a veteran. I've been to war. I served in both the United States Marine Corps and the Infantry and the United States Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Said joined at uh, 17, went to war more than once. I also served in law enforcement. I worked as a police officer in LAPD doing patrol assignments and more specialized assignments, tracking down fugitives and those kind of jobs. So by God's grace, I've made it through some nasty places and times overseas and some dangerous streets here in the States. Not because I'm better than any of the men that didn't, but because God chose to have mercy and grace on me. To God be the glory. I also served as a private contractor for the U.S. government. See, for an agency I won't specify. By God's grace, he got me through all that, alive and in one piece, both physically and mentally. Not because I deserved it. Not because I was better than those men who didn't. Strictly because God chose to have love and mercy on me. In addition to that, I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember, both rifle and pistol. Um, Mostly pistol are most of my competition and championship wins, but I have also competed in, you know, muzzleloader, archery, shotgun, knife throwing, hatchet throwing. I've been very blessed with those talents and I try and use them and multiply them. I've done quite a bit of hunting and outdoor, I guess we'd say, survival-type activities, hunting and fishing. All over this beautiful country, I have been a professional hunter and guide. Not many people today can see they've been a professional exotic and big game hunter of things like bison and exotic animals, but I have been one, and I'm very blessed for that. I've also gone out into the wilderness, by God's grace, with a Bible and a shotgun, and not just survived, but thrived. Also a professional firearms instructor. For the United States Marine Corps, I was an urban warfare and desert warfare instructor under a Mojave Viper. I'm also a FBI certified firearms instructor and have been for a lot of years. I'm uh, certified by some other three-letter government agency, NRA certified instructor. And I have taught at one of the big name firearms shooting academies in the country. So I've been very blessed to win many competitions and be a shooting instructor for military, law enforcement, and civilians. I have served as a commander of a tactical team. My current full-time job is as a leader of a tactical team 
primary mission is to stop active shooters in a fairly large metropolitan area. Alright, enough about me and my bio, guys. Let's get into today's topic, which is going to be close in, down and dirty, brutal gunfighting. Or fighting in general. Now you probably guess where I'm going to start if you heard the bio. You start always with God, God number one. The first of all the commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You start every fight that way also. The battle is the Lord's, for it says in Deuteronomy. And when the Lord your God delivers into your hands, you shall strike every male with the edge of the sword. Or Deuteronomy 7, but the Lord your God will turn them over to you and will throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. Or how about the first chapter of Joshua? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Or how about one of my personal favorites? Psalm 144, Blessed be the Lord my rock, trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So you go into that battle confident that God is with you. And if God is for you, no man can stand against you. And if God's not for you, that's probably not a battle you should be fighting. But if God is with you, then go into that fight with confidence. The battle is always in your mind before it's in your hands. Before any action manifests itself in your hands, in your fingers, in your arms, it first starts in your brain. Another good verse. Mark eleven twenty four. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you've received them and you will have them. You believe first and then you see them manifested. You believe and then you receive. That's the divine order. Go into that fight with confidence. Confidence that you're coming out alive. With that said, we're talking in close often referred to as CQB gunfighting. And in general, one of the good rules, not always, but a good rule of gunfighting is the first person to get a good solid hit on target will usually prevail because they'll be able to get more good hits on target. So getting your shots on target quickly. But just like any other part of gunfighting, don't neglect the fundamentals. You can't miss fast enough to win a gunfight. As the Rifleman's Creed says, it's the hits that count. We will hit. Now, I'm a big fan of always starting off and practicing with the fundamentals, and I believe that most of your gunfighting practice, dry fire, live fire, should be on accuracy and the fundamentals. My main go-to is precision shooting with a handgun, 50-yard headshots. That's almost always where I start, unless I'm really confined for time. I don't have time to practice on other skill, but the vast, vast majority of the time, that's where I start 50-yard headshots, standing offhand. Offhand means standing unsupported with a handgun. And I would advise the same for you. But I don't do the same draw if I'm practicing different skills. I don't practice the same draw at 25 yards as I practice at 50 yards. I don't practice the same draw and sight picture at 25 yards as I do at 15 or at 7. I don't do the same speed or sight alignment at 7 yards on a torso shot that I do on a head shot. It's very hard to be accurate superbly accurate and it's hard to be fast but it takes a master to balance speed and accuracy to know when to speed up and when to slow down to know when to shoot and when to wait to get a better shot or to get a good hit you're almost always better off waiting for a good hit waiting for that good shot to pull the trigger and you are taking a bad shot missing and recovering from it for a variety of reasons so keep that in mind another thing about up close, in tight, gunfighting, expect to get hit, expect to get physical. You know, if you know what it's like to get punched in the face, expect to get punched in the face, expect to get hit. Don't be surprised if blood is a thing. Starting off with close in gunfighting, this is gunfighter life, but your base should be hand to hand combat because it's most likely going to be involved in some kind of way. So you should have some kind of base in fighting, some kind of base in Mixed martial arts, some kind of base in wrestling. Didn't mention in my bio, it's generally not germane to gunfighting life. But I was one of the captains of my wrestling team. I wrestled for years. I have done some ground fighting, mixed martial arts, whatever you want to call it. I am by no means, I would not consider myself a professional ground fighter like, you know, Matt Hughes or Joe Rogan. But I've been in a few fights. And as you could probably tell from the bio, I've done it in a real world setting. And by God's grace, not because I'm special, he brought me out of those things alive. You should have a base in fighting and ground fighting. You should know how to throw a punch, how to take a punch. You should know how to get up off the ground. You should know how to control your adversary on the ground. You should know some of those things. That should be your base to build on with gunfighting. 
that gunfight may be intensely physical before you ever get a chance or they ever get a chance for a gun to even be unholstered. In any kind of warrior throughout cultures, I can't think of one where fitness, where physicality, where being in shape is not valuable and it's valuable here. We'll transition to when I joined the Marine Corps. Bayonets were taught. Knife fighting was taught. Pugil sticks were taught. We beat the crap out of each other in a pit with pugil sticks. Learning part of this, which is close in combat. And I'm talking right now with a long gun. We'll also talk about handguns, but with a long gun. Pugil sticks. Bayonet fighting. You don't have to have a bayonet for this to apply. The same strokes, the same things you can do with a bayonet, you can do without a bayonet. A muzzle device to the mouth with authority would be a good technique to either buy you some time or change someone's behavior. So the thrust. Obviously, this is an audio podcast. This is stuff you can look up visually, but a thrust. Very similar to what we talked about earlier to throwing a punch. Similar stance, similar, except you're using both hands on the weapon instead of just one hand. But a thrust or a jab, a slash, and then a butt stroke. If you're equipped with a long gun, you should know those things. Know those three basic strikes. So once in a while when you're dry firing, like we all should be as gunfighters, don't be afraid to throw in a little hand-to-hand, a little close quarters, a little thrusting, a little butt strokes. Gunfighting is a martial art. But know those with a long gun. Like I said, I got that experience in the Marine Corps. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. And I was sad to find out that the Army, I don't believe, any longer teaches bayonet fighting, which I think is sad. Nor do I believe they do pugil stick fighting. But to be fair, a lot of the Army are not gunfighters. You know, you've got a lot of other MOSs, you've got a lot of other jobs, which is to be fair. I mean, you also, in today's day and age, people have to fix satellite dishes and work on helicopters and things like that. But if you're going to be a gunfighter, you ought to know those things. Why? A few reasons. One, if you have a long gun, if you run out of ammo, that's still a pretty good melee weapon. I mean, think of a full-size Remington 870 or Mossberg 500 shotgun. Think about the amount of damage you can do with that with a good solid butt stroke. Or a full-size AR-15. Even if it's out of ammo, if that guy's in close, that's still a formidable weapon. So out of ammo, one might be one good reason. Another good reason would be And I don't advise this, but for whatever reason, you decided not to have a round in the chamber. If you just got to your gun and there's no round in the chamber, like we talked about earlier, you know, a muzzle to the mouth really hard might buy you some time to get a round in the chamber. So think about that. In like manner, a malfunction. AR's malfunction. I had a catastrophic malfunction with my AR during the war. Meaning like it could not be fixed with remedial action, with a tap rack bang or anything like that. It had to be fixed by a gunsmith with tools. So a malfunction, if you have a malfunction, you know, doing a butt stroke and then getting that weapon fixed. Or doing a butt stroke letting you get to your secondary weapon. I think those are good enough reasons for you to be able to know this stuff. And another reason is less lethal. Taking a life is not something to be taken lightly. There have been times where I could have legally taken a life, and legally it would have been justified. But I've never not taken a life where I didn't think that I had to and regretted it. Just because you legally can doesn't mean that you morally should. There could be a bunch of different scenarios in which you don't want to take a life, but you have the long gun. Maybe it's somebody you can tell is obviously really drunk trying to get into your house to reach in around and open the door. Maybe they're just drunk and think they're on the wrong, at the wrong house. Maybe you give them a nice butt stroke and break their arm or their hand to stop them from getting in the house. And if they still continue to try to get in the house, maybe you escalate. But maybe the drunk dude trying to get in the wrong house is not a reason to unload around a double up buck in his chest. And of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. You may or may not know that at the time, but it's something you're going to have to live with. It's a good thing to know. Next, let's talk about contact shots. Contact shots with most rifles and shotguns should not be an issue. With your ARs, your SCARs, your Remington 870s, anything like that, you have your muzzle up against something, an adversary, that should not be an issue with a contact shot. Talking about that, it's a good transition to the handguns. 
Now, pistols contact shots can be a problem. With most modern semi-automatic pistols, the vast majority, if you press the muzzle up against something, there's a very good chance that slide is going to go out of battery. You're going to press that barrel and that slide back and that gun will not fire. So you need to know that there are techniques to make it fire, but something like a Glock reaching your thumb up and shoving it on the back of the slide and shoving that muzzle into something hard, you can still have it fire one shot. Is that a good thing to know and practice? But just know that for most modern semi-autos, you don't want a contact shot. But we said that hand-to-hand, -hand, know that you're hand-to-hand -hand combat, know how to throw an elbow, try and make some space. Space can give you time, time can give you options. Like I said, know your hand-to-hand. -hand. But know that for most modern semi-auto handguns, contact shots can be an issue. If you're down on the ground with a handgun, fighting, that's not the time to find out how your weapon operates and what, under what conditions it will and won't fire. You should know that. One of the good advantages of a revolver, and one of my go-to you know, concealed carry weapons, is a revolver. Carry a five-shot Smith & Wesson 360 PD, which is a 357 Magnum five-shot revolver. I generally keep most of the rounds loaded with 38 Special because I get faster follow-up shots that way. But for one of those reasons, I can shoot that talking extreme close quarters with a revolver, I can shove that into a target. I can shove it in as hard as I want. I can do a muzzle strike like I can do with a rifle. Not this exactly the same technique, but I mean, I can shove that muzzle into something. I don't have to worry about it malfunctioning the weapon. Also, I can shoot it inside a pocket. I can shoot it inside a coat pocket, especially if I'm wearing something like a hoodie. I can have my hand on the grip of that gun. I can be firing that gun, and the person may never even know until the gun goes off. Just like their strikes with a rifle, their strikes with a handgun. Like I said, go back to your hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. If you know how to do a hammer fist, it's just even more effective with a firearm. You know, doing a hammer fist with a 1911, that's 40-some ounces or more of metal. There's a limit to what we can really cover in an audio format, and there are several different in-tight shooting techniques. Knowing how to shoot and get hits from the draw, from the low ready, You'll often see on like YouTube and things these kind of, you know, weapons takeaways and stuff like that. And you see the guy with like one hand with the gun fully reached out and like the guy reaches out and grabs it. You shouldn't do that. As a professional gunfighter, if the guy is within arm's reach, your arm should not be fully out. Your arm should be tucked in close to your side. Your sights, your slide should be indexed against your body or your revolver or whatever should be indexed against your body. If that guy's close enough to grab your gun, there should be no reason that your gun is at full extension. It gives you less of a mechanical advantage. So learn, learn those shooting skills. Learn those in-close techniques. Know when you're bringing that gun up and you see those sights. When you see that front sight, and that guy's taking up all your vision. His body is pretty much the entire field of view. When you see your front sight somewhere in an acceptable zone of that target to press the trigger, practice those skills. The car technique, you can look that up. I have practiced that. I would say enough to be proficient in it. It is effective. It does work. It keeps the gun close to me, which I like. And it is surprisingly a surprisingly effective to get good hits on target. Another thing I will say, you may or may not be fighting in this, but if you're about to take a shot, if you can have two hands on the gun, get two hands on the gun. For a lot of different reasons, it gives you more control, it gives you faster follow-up shots in general, and you don't want that guy to get the gun. Probably better for you to take a couple punches to the face or wherever else than for the other guy to get the gun. So if you can have two hands on the gun, get two hands on the gun. One of the reasons you should practice on your draw, getting your other hand up. You'll see a lot of people, especially new people, trying to learn how to do the draw. They'll bring their one hand to the gun and then they'll bring the support hand up. You should be moving both hands simultaneously and you should get both hands on that gun as quick as you can for the reasons previously stated. Whatever technique you're practicing, close, close up gun fighting. I would say remember your safety rules. I would encourage you to remember your third safety rule or however you memorize them, but this safety rule. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are aligned on target. Remember what we talked about in the beginning. Be the first to get a good hit. Every time you pull that trigger, you have the potential to end a life. You should know where that round is going to go. There are other ways to determine where your sights are. Proper sight alignment with your vision is the predominant way the way that we use the vast majority of the time, but it's not the only way to be sure that your hits are going to make it on target. If that gun is in my hand and that muzzle, I know where the front sight is in relation to the muzzle there, 
one's right above the other. If I my muzzle is pressed into the target, I know where my sights are. I know where my front sight is and my rear sight is, you know, unless they've broken off the gun. I know where they are in relation to the muzzle, so I know if the muzzle is somewhere where the sights are. So I'm not breaking that safety rule. If one arm is wrapped around my target holding him in tight so he can't move, and my other hand is on my gun properly, and that gun is indexed against my rib cage, I know where those sights are. But any technique where you're not using that third safety rule or that safety rule, I would question that technique. You shouldn't just, you know, be pulling the trigger and crossing your fingers. That's not how gunfighting works. Next thing we'll talk about with enclosed gunfighting is retention. We already covered it a little bit. Like I said, get both hands on that gun as, as soon as you can. We talked about the strikes with the long gun. You can also obviously use those as retention if you can. But, you know, don't just use your hands. Don't just use your arms. Just like when throwing a punch or throwing a kick, use your whole body. There's ways that are better done with visual on how to, if somebody grabs the muzzle of your gun, how to rotate it a certain orientation towards their hand to break to break their grip. I have practiced those techniques. I would advise you to look them up and know them with a long gun, with a handgun. You know, but like grabbing that gun, pulling in tight to you and stepping back with your entire body. Knowing how to grab your gun in your holster to keep it in your holster. You know, shoving your elbow down. If somebody reaches over on your holster and tries to grab your gun, shoving your elbow down. You know, if it's a life or death struggle for them to get your gun, breaking fingers if needed. But far more effective than you trying to get a couple of hand, your hand on top of their hand. Shove your elbow down. Do as hard as you can. And like we talked about, use your use your hand-to-hand -hand combat, your fighting techniques. Throw an elbow. Throw a throw an open hand palm strike. You know, do an eye gouge if you need to. We're talking about brutal in close gunfighting, but weapons retention should be something you're acquainted with. If we're talking about a knife, again, you go back to your base, your hand-to-hand -hand combat, your strikes, your hammer fist, your ground fighting. You build on that and make that more effective with a knife. We talked about retention. If you can use one elbow to keep your weapon in the holster and then use your other hand to grab a knife, that knife becomes a tool to, for you to retain your other weapon. That knife, like we talked about, buys you time and gives you options either to get away or to get your primary weapon out. You can do whatever you want, but in general, I carry my firearm on one side. If I'm talking a handgun, I carry it on one side, and I carry a blade, a knife, on the other side. If I'm laying on the ground or something on my gun side and I can't get to my gun or I can't get it out, I can still get to my knife on my other side. Or if I'm in a struggle trying to retain my weapon with one hand, I can get to my knife with the other hand. Gunfighting can be brutal, fights can be brutal, knife fighting can be especially brutal. That's my go-to way to carry a knife is on my non-gun side. There are some other techniques and I have been, I've recently been doing a little bit more experimenting and practicing with uh, knife techniques. I have some training and experience in that and uh, I've been trying to go back to those. I've been trying some other techniques. I've been trying carrying a fixed blade which obviously has some advantages and disadvantages, and I've tried carrying a neck knife. I don't know that a neck knife is for me. A lot of times, well, let's just say I like continuity of training, and a lot of times when I'm at work, I carry body armor. I carry a shirt tucked in, but if you're the kind of person that, you know, doesn't tuck in his shirt most of the time, and a neck knife may be good for you because you can get to it generally with either hand, and they're generally fixed blades, which has some advantages. So maybe look into a neck knife, you know, there's advantages to folders, there are advantages to fixed blades. Less important than the knife is that you know how to use it, though. Like I said in the beginning, confidence. I have confidence when I go into that fight that my God is with me and will deliver my adversary into my hand. If you give that person a $500 custom-made, you know, super ultra knife fighter 5000 and you give me a butter knife that's dull, I still go in expecting to win that fight. But just put it in, you know, earthly terms. If I give a pretty proficient good UFC fighter a butter knife and I give some guy that's never been hit in the face that's never been in a hand-to-hand -hand combat never had any training in it I give him the best knife in the world who do you think is going to win that fight who are you going to put as your top pick for coming out on top of that fight skill is important so many times as Americans we want that next thing and I, I'm no I like I like nice stuff guys I generally run you know a couple of my go-to handguns are, you know, STIs. They're like the Ferrari of handguns. I like nice stuff. But you can't, you're, you can't buy your way out of those kind of problems. You have to practice. You have to train. You have to dry fire if you want to be an expert. Forge yourself as a man, as a gunfighter. As it is written, to he who has more shall be given and he will have in abundance. It's what Jesus says. 
you're given a talent, you use it, you develop it. It's a gift. It's meant to be enjoyed and prospered and multiplied. One of the good rules for, well, a couple of things that I would say. For knife fighting, especially if you're on the ground, if it's you and another guy, if it's soft and it's not you, that's a good place for a knife. Another thing that I would say is if, if possible, you're practicing your techniques in your fighting stance, whether it's your lead hand or your other hand there are different ways different techniques to hold a knife i'm not getting into going into the advantages of like holding it in one hand to parry or holding in your rear hand obviously like i said there are limitations to audio podcasts but if you can practice techniques where that knife is felt before it's seen if we're talking about a life and death struggle if you can have that knife felt by your adversary before it's seen by your adversary that's a big advantage i'm not the guy that's like everything's got to be multi-cam that's you know that's not me but you know, Krylon is cheap. Spray paint is cheap. Some things I don't really worry about being highly reflective, but if it's a knife or a knife blade, you may want to think about dulling it up. And it, it can be like silver as long as it's like a matte, not super shiny silver. If it's going to be a, a fighting knife or a fighting something like that. You know, I know it's, I guess, the quintessential gunfight where two men walk out in the street and the clock strikes noon and they draw, you know, and fire at seven paces or whatever the classic dueling distance is. I don't know. But I've never been in a gunfight like that, and I don't know anybody that has. You don't know what situation it's going to be. You don't know if it's going to be at 50 yards with a pistol. You don't know if it's going to be at arm's length with a pistol. You should train for a variety of situations. This is gunfighter life. I know we've talked about some serious things today. Like I said, remember, just because you legally can take a life doesn't mean that it, you should or that it's the best option. Just from a man who's been to war. Death is a horrible thing, and I've seen enough of it to know that I don't want to see any more than I have to. With that, guys, let's wrap up the main topic of this. You may have noticed recently uh, just the housekeeping stuff that I rolled out, some re-podcasts. I tried something new. I tried to put out the Survival Gun series one after another, after another, every day. I know that some people go back and listen to old episodes. I don't know that everybody goes back and, and listens to all the old episodes. Some people, we have a lot more new listeners, which is great. We're very blessed. I appreciate all you guys that share this podcast with others, all you guys that continue to listen. But I thought that the survival guns, especially with the world that we live in and all the stuff going on, will be a good series for maybe people that just tuned in and subscribed that didn't go back and listen to old episodes. So if you've been hungry for a new episode, I appreciate you hanging in there. I appreciate you standing by. This is a new episode. I've been trying to put out some new episodes, some older episodes, but I appreciate your guys. I appreciate the support and the comments, even the constructive criticism. I really appreciate that, guys. I appreciate the community of listeners. I appreciate everybody that supports the podcast. On that note, guys, I'm just going to be real with you guys. This podcast and the other podcasts that we do, the Alpha Male podcast and Simple Man Sermons, they cost money for years and years and years. And like we talked about today, you know, some of these things would be better on YouTube, on things like that, where you can get a visual. If that's something you guys are interested in, let me know. That's something, I'll be honest, just being real with you guys, you know, I work, I'm still a professional gunfighter. I lead a tactical team. I work, you know, 12 or 8 hour grave shifts. I work tonight. So if you guys want to see stuff like that, please step up and help support the podcast. I don't really want, like, company sponsors. I don't want to be a sellout. I don't want things like that. I've had sponsors in the past when I was a competition shooter. I try to get away from that because I don't want to be the guy that recommends a band, band, uh, brand rather, just because they give me stuff or give me free stuff for support. I'd rather it come from the community. I'd rather you guys support that way. There's no bribes. There's no nothing like that. I give you guys an honest opinion. If you want to support, like I said, like, subscribe, write a review of the podcast, share it with your friends. If you have it in your heart to support financially, you can go to Patreon, type in Good Shepherd Training. It's the umbrella that houses all those podcasts, Alpha Male Podcast, Simple Man Sermons, and Gunfighter Life. Good Shepherd Training on Patreon. You can also just go to Patreon and type in Gunfighter Life. If you want to support financially, you can. You know, If you want to give a dollar, there's a thing on there you can give a dollar a month. If you don't want to give a dollar a month, you can give a dollar once. You can sign up and then... It'll give me a dollar and you can cancel it. If you want to send me questions or messages, go to Patreon. Get on there, send me a message. But if you want to support Good Shepherd Training on Patreon, goodshepherdtraining.com. 
Good Shepherd Training on Instagram. Obviously, it's just going to be pictures pretty much on Instagram, but you can check those out. If you're a more visual person, you want to see some of the guns that I run, some of the knives that I run, some of the stuff like that. There may be a shooting video on there or two. I'm not, I, I think there probably is. I think there may be even one part of a stage of a shooting competition. Uh, one of the national shooting competitions I competed in is just part of a stage because there's a limit to how long the, how long they can be. But anyway, guys, I appreciate you sticking around to the end. Something I'm trying to do to improve the podcast. I'll give you a tactical tip for sticking around to the end. I appreciate it. Okay, so we're talking about close quarters gunfighting. One of the things that I like to do with my gunfighting handguns, take a piece of obnoxiously bright tape, like duct tape or a sticky sticker. I got these little square stickers, maybe, I don't know, three quarters of an inch by an inch. Bright orange, bright yellow, whatever. Get whatever color most contrasts your slide or whatever color sticks out to you the best and stick that on the base of your slide right behind your front sight. So when you're doing a more traditional sight in, you can't see it at all. It doesn't obscure your vision. It doesn't change your sight picture at all. But when you're doing those close in techniques, when you're practicing your draw and you're bringing that gun up and that front sight is slightly elevated and you're bringing that gun up into your vision, you can pick up that big obnoxious color fast and you can drive it into your target and then transition when that goes away, you transition to your front sight. But it's just a little tiny thing. You know, you can also do it. I have it on one of my guns where I just took some bright obnoxious colored nail polish and just painted a little spot on the, on the slide right behind the front sight. But just a little tactical tip. Like I said, is it like I said with the other stuff, you got to practice the technique. But if you want to give it a shot and if you don't like you you peel it off. Probably have to peel it off from time to time anyway because it's going to get scratched up. It's going to get covered in oil or something like that. All right, guys, with that, I think we'll wrap up this episode. With that, I'm just going to say thanks and have a blessed day. Amen.